all doing today? Brilliant, great. Well, I think you're all looking mighty fine on this bank holiday weekend. Can you believe it's the end of August? Phil's dreading going back to school. Maybe I'm ready for school to start again. Maybe. <laughs> but today, I'm glad that you're here. And we're actually in our final part of the series that we've been doing called Wisdom for Life. And over the last few weeks, Pastor Derek and Pastor Georgina have shared with us a proverb. And they've unpicked that proverb with us to show us actually how we can apply that in our Christian walk, our Christian journey today. And we're going to carry on with that series. But just so that you know, the book of Proverbs, it was written by a guy called, or the majority of it was written by a guy called King Solomon. Solomon was the son of David. You might have heard of David. He was the guy who slew um, the giant Goliath with five little pebbles that he took from the brook. But he was David's son. And Solomon took on the responsibility of being king. And he was only very young when he did this. He was about the age of 19. But Solomon at a young age knew the responsibility that he would have to carry. And one night God appeared to Solomon in a dream. And he said to Solomon in this dream, what is it you want? You can have anything that you want. Solomon could have asked for anything. But the thing he asked for was wisdom. And God was pleased with that response. And he actually said to Solomon, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice, and you've not asked for a long life, you've not asked for loads of money, you've not asked for me to, you know, get rid of some of those people that are getting on your nerves. He says, I will give you what, I, what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart. And in this book of Proverbs, Solomon leaves us with a book of legacy on wisdom. It's a book that's packed with really brief statements, but so much truth. And when we listen to these wise words, it helps us to try and live a godly life. Well, I had the privilege of picking the proverb that I wanted to share with you today. But as I was pondering on what proverb to talk on, I said to Phil, you any ideas? And he suggested that I speak on Proverbs 21 verse 9. So I looked it up thinking this might be the one that God wants me to speak on. And it says this, it's better to live alone in the corner of an attic <laughs> than with a quarrelsome wife in a lovely home. Phil settled well into the loft in our house. <laughs> and I'll let you know when he comes out. Just for those that don't know me, I am joking. Not about Phil suggesting the proverb. He was deadly serious. <laughs> well, to help us introduce the verse that we're going to look at today, I want you to watch the screen. Oh no, oh no! I'm lost! Where's the light? Oh, it just went away! Oh, what do I do? Help! We'll be stuck here forever! Do not panic! Do not panic! We are trained professionals! Now stay calm! We are going around the leaf! Uh, around the leaf? I, I I don't think we can do that. Oh, nonsense! This is nothing compared to the twig of 93. That's it, that's it, good! You're doing great! There you go, there you go! Watch my eyes, don't look away. And here's the line again! <laughs> thank you, thank you, Mr. Soil! <laughs> good job, everybody! Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. The message version puts it like this. You lazy fool, 
Look at an ant. Watch it closely. Let it teach you a thing or two. I want to ask a question this morning. Has anyone in this place ever had an issue with ants? When my boys were small, my boys are nearly 25 and 27, I kept noticing my youngest son like this on the carpet. And I thought at first he was talking to himself, but I realised that he was talking to his new friends that had come to visit. You see, Jacob loved insects. I mean, I've had snails in my kitchen, worms in the hallway, everything from Jacob. And I looked and I thought, where are they coming from? And I thought, oh, one must have just come in from outside. But then the following day, I kid you not, there were more of Jacob's friends roaming around my carpet. After a bit, I followed these ants and I peeled back the corner of the lounge carpet and I was absolutely horrified. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ants. Obviously, I squealed like any big girl would. We got the ants dealt with, leaving me with a distraught three-year-old who wanted to keep every ant as his pet. While I didn't want the ants living with me, there was something fascinating about them. You know, in the clip that we watched in, from a film called It's a Bug Life, we got a glimpse of just seeing how these little ants work. And over the last couple of weeks, I've been reading a lot about these little insects, and they're quite fascinating creatures. I mean, I still don't want them living with me, but they are quite fascinating. Ants, they're just common insects, but they have some unique capabilities. And we're just going to look at a few of these today just to help us in our Christian journey, just to help us in the things that we face on a day-to-day -day business. Firstly, ants look out for the next generation. Ants are known for being very protective of their young. They never leave the eggs or the baby ants unprotected. They actually have a team of ants that are there to protect the young. How incredible is that? They stand by protecting them from danger. They take responsibility for the next generation. Psalm 78, and I think Noah's going to pop that up for me. It says this. Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I am saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power. And his mighty wonders. You know, in this psalm, the author, it was a guy called Asaph that wrote the psalm. But he appeals to his generation to share the things of old, the things that previous generations have learned. And you know, Asaph and his generation had so much to praise the Lord for. The rest of the psalm, and I can encourage you, you know, read that when you get home. But it talks about the things that God has done. It talks about the time that he brought the Israelites out of captivity. It talks about the time that God parted the Red Sea to allow Moses to take his people through it. It talks about the time that the cloud guided them through the wilderness. It talks about his choice of David, Solomon's dad has been the next anointed king. Asaph's generation had so much to praise God for and so much to tell the next generation. But you know, church, it's the same for us. We have a story to tell. We have a story to tell. Whatever age you are in here, whether you are the youngest or the eldest, we have a generation to pass something on to. You know, we can... Not only pass on the word of God and the wonderful stories contained in that, but we can tell our own story, our story of God's saving grace, our story of his faithfulness to our lives. Do you know what? When you meet a non-Christian, no one can ever argue with your story because that's your story. And we have a duty to pass on what God is doing in our lives, to tell the next generation, to share his faithfulness. 
You know, on a Sunday, I have the privilege of sitting near the front and I look over to our wonderful young people and I see them with some of our giants. And you know what that's a picture of? It's a picture of our young people worshipping God through song, but showing, passing on that story to our younger children of how to praise God. How incredible is that? But you know, church, it doesn't stop with our young people. It's the same for me and it's the same for you. We all have a responsibility to tell our children, to tell our younger generations about God's goodness and God's faithfulness. This morning, I was reading in my quiet time, Psalm 102, and one of the verses said this, let this be written for a future generation that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. A reminder of our responsibility for all of us to think about our future generations You know, our children and young people, they live in an ever-changing culture in their schools, in their universities, in their colleges. I'm 51, so it's not that long ago that I was at school. But boy, people are laughing at that. But boy, have things changed. Things that I know the young people are dealing with and hearing in schools I never would have heard any of that. I would never have been aware of the complex society in which we live. Our children, young people, live in a world that says, you can be whoever you want. You can do whatever you want. It's okay to look after number one. Our future generations need to hear the life-transforming, powerful message of Jesus. The transforming message of Jesus. We need to pass on that story that he is the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only life. You know, I love listening to stories of how God has worked in those that are much further on in their Christian journey than I am. This morning in the pre-meet, we were looking at some of Derek's books And when my granddad died, he passed on his books and his commentaries to me. And I love nothing more than opening up those pages and seeing the little notes that he wrote in. And it was almost like some of them I needed to read now because he's passing on that story of God's goodness in his life. I'm also encouraged when those newer to faith share things with me as well because it keeps me on my toes. And I know, again, some of our young people, I love it when you talk to them. If you've not had a conversation with them, have a conversation with them, because honestly, it keeps you on your toes. It keeps you alive. It helps you with your thinking. It challenges you. Today, as we think about looking after our future generations, I just want to be a little bit practical this morning. Is that okay? Because these are just some of the ways we can do that. We can encourage our giants and youth leaders. We can pray for them. Today after the service, you'll see the kids running around in the coffee shop. Ask them what they've learned in giants. Ask them, is there something that I can pray for you for? As a generation, we can pass on the stories of God's faithfulness in our lives. We can share stories of his goodness. We can share the miracles that we've seen happen in this place and beyond. We can get alongside another parent and just say, I've been there. Don't worry, you can get through this. Let's be a people that look out for the next generation. Ants not only value future generations and the generations they've got around them, but ants value relationships. You know, when I peeled back my carpet and there were so many ants all hustling, bustling together, but there was also sort of like unity amongst them. They were all going in the same direction. They all had a purpose. They all had a role to play. Ants are actually known for being really social creatures. 
They live in colonies. They live in homes. They value togetherness. You know when an ant is carrying something and it's a little bit heavy, other ants come alongside it and help to carry the load. And that reminds me of the story of Moses in the Bible. Moses had said to a young Joshua, Joshua, I want you to select some men and you're going to go and fight the Amalekites. He said, and I'm going to go to the top of the hill and I'm going to pray for you with the staff of God in my hand as you fight the battle. So Joshua did what Moses had said. Moses went up to the top of the hill. He took two friends with him, Aaron and Hur. And when Moses had the staff of God in his hand and had his hands held high in the air, Joshua was winning the battle. But as soon as his hands dropped, the Amalekites started to win. So do you know what Aaron and Hur did? Aaron and Hur stood each side of Moses. They held up his arms. They supported him. So Moses was able to keep his hands lifted high until sunset, resulting in the battle being won. Like the ants and Moses, we all need relationships. We were never meant to do our Christian journey on our own. You know, one of the reasons we have groups like our Thrive Group, which is for those that are over 55, they meet every fortnight. We have connect groups that run in people's homes and in the church as well. One of the reasons we do that is we understand it's hard to make relationships on a Sunday when there's so many people here. But when you join a smaller group, you have the opportunity to do life with other people. And when we do life with other people, it helps us. It shapes us. We get to be a part of somebody else's story. You know, I got married at the age of 22. 29 years this year with my husband who now lives in the attic. (laughs) But I went on honeymoon, got married, went on honeymoon. And as we flew back into Manchester Airport, suddenly I realised my whole life had changed. I was 22. I moved to Manchester. All my family were in Derby. I even had to order the same washing machine as my mum because I had no idea how to run a home. I got the same washing machine so I could just say, Mum, what number do you put a white load on? It worked, I still do that now. Everything changed. I didn't live near my family and my friends. My workplace changed. My community changed. My church changed. I cannot tell you how thankful I am as I look back on the way the church embraced me, the way the church helped me, the way the church invited me around to their house. I would never, ever have settled so well as a young 22-year-old when everything changed if it hadn't been for the church. You know, the church wasn't man's idea. The church was God's idea. He said he would build his church. This church might be called Kings and we are so thankful for our senior pastors, Derek and Georgina, who lead us. But the church is God's church. The church isn't about the building. And while we're thankful for this wonderful building, the church is not about the building. The church is the people. Right at the beginning of time, when you go back to Genesis, God never meant us to do life on our own. He created relationships so that we could be in relationship with one another. Paul Tripp, um, it's going to come up and I'll just read it to you, in his book called Whiter Than the Snow, Meditations on Sin and Mercy, wrote something that I just thought was just brilliant when it talks about relationships. We weren't created to be independent, autonomous, or self-sufficient. We were made to live in a humble, worshipful, and loving dependency upon God, and in a loving and humble interdependency with others. Our lives were designed to be community projects, yet the foolishness of sin tells us 
that we have all that we need within ourselves. So we settle for relationships that never go beneath the casual. We defend ourselves when the people around us point out a weakness or a wrong. We hold our struggles within, not taking advantage of the resources God has given us. The truth is we need each other. God gave us each other to walk alongside, to encourage, to spur one another along in the faith. Who have you got in your world this morning? And I know some of you will be coming from a place of hurt and they've been hurt in previous relationships. And I think if we're being honest in this place, we've probably all been hurt by a relationship, could be a marriage, a friendship, a working relationship, a dispute with neighbours. You've got your own story. But can I just encourage you this morning to not let that past hurt stop you from making God-given relationships. Do you know there are some amazing people in this place today who would add such value to your world would add such friendship to your world. You see, when we do life together, it eradicates the loneliness. It eradicates those feelings of, nobody wants me. Maybe today as we look out for each other, we look out for people on their own, and we start to get alongside one another. And we just start to value those God-given relationships. Ants, they don't just look after future generations. They don't only value relationships, but they are amazing at serving one another. Who knew that you could learn so much from ants, by the way? Ants work for the good of the group. They serve one another. You know, today at quarter to nine in this place, there was a group of people meeting here to serve Jesus, but also to serve you and to serve one another. Teams met to pray together, to prepare together. I'm going to list some of the teams, and if I forget your team, then just blame me. I'm 51 after all. Forgive me. We have our prayer team our pastoral team, our worship team, our technical team at the back. We have our welcome team. We have our stewards, our car park team, our communications team, our giants team, our blend team. So blend team are the ones that brew up and they make toast for everybody that serves. Honestly, it's well worth coming to serve just for the toast. But they do it on a Sunday, and I know many, many people serve within the week as well. But do you know why they do that? It's because they understand what it says in Romans 12, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. Jesus sets the ultimate example when it comes to serving. In the book of Mark, it says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom to many. What an astounding statement. If anyone should expect to be served, it would be Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Yet his life on earth was filled with examples of serving. He fed the poor. He preached the truth. He washed the feet of the disciples. I'm not going to lie. I'm glad we don't have to do that. I don't like feet. He met people where they were at. He prayed with people. He mentored people. He healed the sick. And ultimately, he gave his life 
for you and for me. Let's be a people that serve Jesus, serve one another. And if you're interested in serving church, then please get in touch. Because we want you to be a part of what's happening here. Ants, they look after future generations. They value relationships. They serve one another. And ants work hard. Do you know, ants have a reputation for being hard workers. When I looked at these little ants in my lounge, it was as if they were marching somewhere. They were on a journey. There was purpose in where they were going. But do you know what about ants? They are strong. Ants can lift up to 20 times of their body weight. Now, I've been going to the gym. Thank you for those laughing. It should be. Well done, Claire. Thank you. Thank you. I've just gone up on some weights. I've no idea what this weight's called, but you basically do that on this machine. I'm now on 25 kilograms. Thank you. That's not even half of my body weight. Ants can lift up, I'm sure they do this too, up to 20 times of their body weight. How incredible is that? Ants work hard. Ants use the strength that they've been given to work hard. You know, the verse in Proverbs, let's just be clear, isn't saying don't rest. It's saying work hard, but it's not saying don't rest. The Bible's really, really clear on how important rest is. But what does that mean for each of us in here today? For our young people going back to school, it means work hard. You don't have to be the top of the class. No one's asking any of you to be that. Work hard. Maybe when the teacher's talking, you listen to the teacher. You show them some respect. Maybe when you've got a deadline, don't get it in the last minute. Get it in the day before. What about us, for us that are working? We do our hours, maybe a bit more. If we start at nine, let's get in there for quarter two. These are just practical ways in which we can replicate what this verse is saying when it says, watch the ants, learn from them. What about those that carry out a role at home? We make sure our homes are a safe space. We make sure it's a place where it's wholesome talk. The way in which others are spoken about, it's in a way that's honouring. Colossians 3.23 says this, work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. When I started my role as a nurse on a critical care unit, I started working in a place called Coventry, and I couldn't wait to meet this nurse called Sue. She was on holiday for the first two weeks that I'd started there. And people would say things like this. Oh, you love Sue. Whenever anybody gets a patient that Sue's been looking after, it's brilliant because everything's done above and beyond. All the families love Sue. All the nurses want to work with Sue. Well, two weeks later, I got to meet Sue. Sue loved Jesus. And Sue did exactly what that verse said. Work willingly at whatever you do, though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. Do you see what I'm saying, church? By when we, whatever we do, whatever we've been asked to do, in whatever place we find ourselves, let's work willingly as though we were working for him and not for others. See, we can make a difference, each and every one of us, in wherever God's placed us. 
There's a verse in Matthew 5, and I love how the message puts it. It says this. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light. Bringing out the God colours in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this. As public as a city on the hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God. This generous Father in heaven. I love that. Me and you are here to be the God colours in the world. A few lessons from the ants. Ants take responsibility for the next generation. They value relationships. They serve one another. They work hard. And I've just got a final thought to share about these insects. Just lean in and listen because this is just amazing. An anthill is made of mineral soil excavated by thousands of worker ants in the process of building the underground colonies that they call home. This makes ants one of Earth's leading manufacturers of the topsoil trees need. Ant soil makes for outstanding compost. But listen to this. A tree seedling that finds itself growing in ant soil will have an advantage that will last for the rest of its life. The work of an ant produces outstanding compost, compost that a tree seedling planted in will have an advantage that will last a lifetime. We have the Word of God. When we are planted in that, when we are immersed in this truth, it will transform us, it will shape us, it will help us, it will challenge us, it will comfort us, it will change us from the inside out. But you know what? It will last a lifetime. Church, are we planted in the Word of God? What's your devotional life like? It's never too late to start. Can I encourage you? You know, if you don't read your Bible, why not start? A great place to start is the book of John because it tells you about the stories of Jesus. Another great place to start is in the Psalms because the Psalms, it just shows that we can be really real, we can get frustrated, we can tell God how we feel, but it reminds us of his unfailing love. It reminds us of his faithfulness, for his promises, for the stories that we can pass on to each generation. You know, my prayer is that me and you together, we learn these lessons from the ant. That as a king's church, we would be a family that look out for our future generations. A family that value relationships. A family that serve one another. A family that are known for the way in which we work. A family that's immersed in the Word of God and that we apply its wisdom to our lives, knowing that it will last a lifetime. Let's pray. Yeah, Father, I just thank you 
for just this short verse that we've just been able to unpack such truth. I thank you for your word. I thank you for these stories that have gone before us. I thank you that we can learn about how you parted the Red Sea, how you chose a shepherd boy to be King David and how that baton was passed on to Solomon. I thank you that we can read and learn so much from these stories. I thank you for the truth found in your word. And Father, I pray that each of us here will be determined and intentional in opening up your word so that we immerse ourselves in it and we allow the Holy Spirit to just speak to us to challenge us, to transform us, because we know that these are things that will last a lifetime. Father, I thank you for every person in this place. I thank you that we have so many different generations here. I thank you that we can call ourselves family. Father, I ask that you would just challenge each of us today, that we would have open hearts, to respond to you in however you want us to respond. But Father, again we say, have your way in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.